Hello, friends, and welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. My name is Scott Cowan, and I'm the host of the show. Each episode, I have a conversation with an interesting guest who is living in or from Washington State. These are casual conversations with real and interesting people. I think you're going to like the show. So let's jump right in with today's guest. I am sitting here with Michelle McGrath of the American Cider Association. I'm having one of those moments where my brain isn't quite keeping up with my mouth or vice versa. I'm not sure. Michelle has agreed to be on the show and full warning everyone. Michelle is from Oregon. That's right. We're having a guest from Oregon on the Exploring Washington <laughs> State podcast. That means that I must really think highly of her and what she's doing. As listeners have known, we've talked to a lot of Washington State ciders, makers, cideries, all of this. And today we thought we would give an industry voice a chance to come on and tell us about cider. So, Michelle, welcome, genuinely welcome to the show. Um, Washington would still accept you if you choose to move across the Columbia. But um, I'm looking at you. And the guests don't see you, but I mean, they're going to see a picture of you on the, on their podcast players, but I'm looking at you and I read a blurb where like 12, 13 years ago, you had your first cider with some, some rogue river blue cheese and it was magical or I'm paraphrasing for you. And you don't, <laughs> you don't look old enough to be doing that. Oh, so wow. you, you, you present yourself as young and here you are the CEO. Tell me, Let's talk about the Cider Association for a second. How did you get involved? Well, funnily enough, it started living across the Columbia River, to be honest. Um, the blue cheese, the blue cheese at a Portland farmer's market was really sort of the impetus for my aha moment that I wanted to be working with farmers. Okay. That, it, it, working at a farmer's market that summer I was in grad school and needed something to do. So I decided to sell cheese at the farmer's market and it was really game changing for me. I grew up on a Christmas tree farm and I don't think I realized how much I enjoyed the agricultural community until I left it, left the Christmas tree farm, came back to work at the farmer's market and it was a light bulb went off. And I dropped out of my PhD and I moved to Underwood, Washington to work with farmers. So I lived in Underwood, Washington for four years where I was working with all sorts of farmers um, on both sides of the Columbia River. You know, in the Columbia River Gorge, they don't get so picky about state borders, but I understand. Uh, and one of the groups of farmers that I was working with were small organic orchardists and this was in 2010 2011 2012 when cider is really starting to take off in a major way it's what i call the first wave of the modern cider revolution mm -hmm. and these orchardists were looking for value-added product opportunities and because i had had that cider at the farmer's market paired with the blue cheese I was geeking out on cider as a consumer, so I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can bring in some cider makers to talk to some of these orchardists, and maybe we can get a cider thing happening in the gorge. Um, and that was sort of a seed that was planted. I, I, I was really interested in cider at that point. Um, you know, to, to make a really long story short, like cheese led me to drop out of my PhD and I accidentally found myself in the nonprofit world supporting farmers, and it was a very, very good fit for me. So I worked to support farmers for a few years in the Columbia River Gorge, and then I worked on grassroots advocacy su supporting farmers and, and the environment um, for a couple years. And that combination of farmer engagement and nonprofit leadership and advocacy and fundraising was just kind of the perfect thing that was needed for the association's first executive director. So 
you know, I applied for the position because I lo- I knew that I loved agriculture and, and cider is an inherently agricultural beverage. Um, and that was almost eight years ago. And uh, I haven't turned back since. Um, I'm, I just really lucked out. That's awesome. That's actually a cool story. It's all yeah. kidding aside. I mean, the, you're right. The gorge, um, the Columbia River Gorge. I think there's a good natured rivalry between the Washington and the Oregon side. Um, uh, but it's a beautiful area for both states. Let, let's be honest. The the Columbia River Gorge, no matter what side of the Columbia you're standing on looking at the whole area, it's it's gorgeous there. So It is. It's stunning. And there is today quite a few, quite a few cideries there. So if anybody is looking for a weekend trip, I'll suggest several in our conversation today. But... The Columbia River Gorge is a good one for cider tasting. I'm going to ask you a, a hard question because you weren't, not that we prepared for this because we, that's kind of the premise, <laughs> but I'm going to throw one at you that you, I believe you know the answer to, but you might okay. not know it off the top of your head. Okay. How, approximately within one, no, just kidding, approximately, how many cideries <laughs> are there in Oregon and how many cideries are there in Washington? Ah, yes, I do know the answer okay. to this. Um, there are around a hundred cideries in Washington and, and I believe around 70, 80 cideries in Oregon. Okay. So, okay. so, um, oh no, 70, sorry. Oregon, let's see, Michigan, New York, California, Washington, Pennsylvania, Oregon. That's the order. That's the order. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, Washington is 98 and Oregon has 67. And, so and you, there are more in Washington. And you said what, what state was, had the most? Michigan has the most. Okay, and how many does Michigan have? Well, according to our research, they have 196. Wow, that's quite a quite a significant yeah. jump from Washington and Oregon. And and what about New York? New York has, I think, around 160 is our yeah. what our research says. Okay, well, both. So, okay, but both states have substantially yeah. larger population bases than Washington and Oregon. Both of them, um, both of them are very large apple growing regions as well. Uh, I don't think of Michigan as apple country, but they actually, from what I've gathered just casually, they, they actually have a pretty large uh, apple presence. Well, so what's interesting is that the top ranking cider states are Michigan, New York, California, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And the top ranking apple states are Washington, New York, Michigan, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and California. See, and I would never so, have thought Pennsylvania was an apple state. Just I, Yeah, I think, I think if you're just on the west yeah. coast you don't really realize but hmm. michigan um michigan grows a lot of apples particularly for processing so like a lot of the apple slices in your kids happy meals come from michigan, from michigan. Okay. um applesauce comes you know a lot of it comes from michigan Mots, um i think used to be oh, really okay. big in michigan or may still be really big okay. um the pennsylvania connection um, I'm not quite quite as familiar with, but yeah. there are a lot of cideries there, and all these states have different personalities to their their cider communities. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the interesting things about Washington's cider scene is that it does have a really high number of orchard based cideries, mm-hmm. and I think that's just because there are a lot of orchards in Washington, right. and there's also a lot of cider drinkers in Washington. So those two things work together to support a really vibrant scene of orchard based cideries. Well, let me ask you another question then that you, since you, you have that at your fingertips or you're looking at it on a screen and you're well-prepared. Um, do you have what States purchase the most cider? Like where cider sales the strongest? (sighs) Yeah. Um, they're very strong in Washington Mm -hmm. and Oregon. Um, Portland does drink more cider per capita than Seattle. That's because they want to be Washington and, <laughs> and this makes them feel. Oh. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's per capita. Mm-hmm. I think Seattle's market is bigger, but per capita Portland drinks. Well, yeah. Um, and Seattle's, but, and Seattle is bigger than Portland. I mean, yes, yeah, so let's be fair. Yeah. There's, there's this um, measurement that is, frankly annoying but there's this measurement (laughs) that we use um to describe how big cider's market share is and the reason it's annoying is because we describe it as a percentage of beer 
but cider is not beer. Right. So it, it, it helps conflate them even more, which we don't want. So pardon me for using this terrible stat, but it's the industry standard. So uh, the average share of beer for cider across the country is 1.1%. Mm -hmm. And it's been 1.1 or 1.2% for a long time. Right. Um, and in Washington, it's 6%. So in Washington, they are drinking a lot more cider than across the country and in other states. So like it's, it's, it, they like cider in Washington, so, for sure. So to, to poke fun at you again, where, where's Oregon at in that number? <laughs> You'll have to give me a second, uh, but it's pretty close. Yeah. It's pretty close. Uh, yes. Let's see if I can pull this up. Oregon. Man, you really are obsessed with Oregon, aren't you? Ooh. 7%. Sorry. Okay, yes. so so Oregon drinks more <laughs> more cider I as mean, a percentage, as yeah. Versus, share, uh, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, I mean, it, you know, one of these things I've also learned is like in Vermont, they drink almost no beer; they're drinking mostly wine. So there, the market share looks really high, but it's a very small number. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. very small oh, number. So yeah, okay. Yeah, that's that's really that's honestly that's. All kidding aside, this is very, very fascinating to me that it, that these states have different, not that I expect the consumer behavior to be the same across 50 states, much less Washington, Oregon, or Washington, California, Oregon, Idaho, you know, it just, it's interesting though. Okay. So yeah. I mean, I think because it's an inherently agricultural beverage and it is very connected to the land and the apples and frankly, the cuisine and how that reflects um, its interaction with cider. It doesn't surprise me that there are like different personalities to all these markets. Okay. So, so here's a question that just popped in my head that I had no idea that I would even be thinking of, much less asking you. Um, from the U.S. standpoint, so not for the entire, the entire United States, how, mm -hmm. how, do, how does cider, how is American cider received over, say, in Europe? or in Asia, mm. is it a, is it a beverage that like the British have a real strong cider culture that mm -hmm. their ciders taste different to me than, than the, the U S ciders that I've had. So how are American ciders accepted outside of the United States? It's one of our goals that American cider is seen as the best cider in the world. And it is, you know, we increasingly has a, um, very positive frame from other cider countries, whether it's the UK or Europe or Australia or New Zealand or Japan or Canada. Um, and, and part of the reason for their sort of growing affection for the U.S. cider market is the proliferation of cideries themselves. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really exciting cideries in the U.S. and they have all different, you know, they're using different apples, they're um, in different parts of the country, so they, they're, they're using different techniques sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just a growing sort of reverence for the American cider community. And part of that is our ability to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is, you know, we're in, in, the, in the second wave of the American cider revolution, which is what we're in right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's a sort of growing acceptance amongst American cideries to ferment American apple varieties instead of English or French apple varieties. They're definitely still like, you know, the champagne grapes or, or the, you know, um, of, of the industry. Mm -hmm. But I think that they're realizing the American palate is maybe more open to exploring cider through apples if they're using American apples. So that is really exciting from the UK perspective. They're getting to taste things that they don't get to taste back home. And some of our producers are, you know, widely respected as not some, many of our producers are widely respected as some of the best um, cider makers in the world. Like we, we have very talented cider makers in the U.S. Um, so between that 
and the American Cider Association and our annual event, CiderCon, which is sort of an international mecca for the cider community, um, American cider is thought of very well from our friends overseas. And we think highly of them too. It's a close community. We all work very closely together. What define, in your, in your opinion, what defines the difference between the first wave of American cider and now this, what you're calling the second wave of American cider? Well, there's more small cideries. Mm -hmm. So there is, are, are more dense clusters of cider country. So you can go to a region like the Columbia River Gorge and visit a lot of cideries mm -hmm. or um, Puget Sound um, or Eastern, Eastern Washington. And it used to be that there weren't that many cideries. And, you know, so access is increasing, increasingly easy. Um, online, you know, being able to purchase ciders online, like, that's been game changing for the cider industry. Wine, you can, you know, wine, that's a huge part of the wine industry. It wasn't a huge part of the cider industry. Mm -hmm. And then the American apple thing, I think, is is really key. But you know, one of the reasons that uh, you know I mentioned that our friends overseas kind of smile um, when they think about the American cider scene is because of its diversity. There are so many different types of cider being made in the U.S. Like the the range in sweetness levels, in flavor, in packaging, in ingredients, in apples is really tremendous. Um, and there is a cider for every palate, for every meal. You know, it's it's the most diverse cider industry easily um, in the world when you think about all the different types that are being produced. So that diversity of, of flavor, um, retailers and industry have been painting the industry with a really broad stroke for a long time. And it's been very frustrating. Mm -hmm. It's been like cider as a beer style, right? Cider as a beer style. It's like, nope, sorry. Cider is not a style. It's actually an entire category with many styles within it. So um, the celebration of that diversity is really key to the second wave. Okay. Now you've mentioned a couple of times the uh, industry tr using more American apples versus the historical anchor components, if you will. I'm kind of adding some words there for you, but American, <laughs> what, what are you seeing? What apples are they, is the industry moving in a direction towards what, what's kind of becoming, I don't want to say popular, but what's, yeah, I'll go popular, I guess. What's, what's, yeah. what are you seeing? What's becoming popular that of us apples? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it depends on what kind of cider maker you're talking about. Um, some cider makers have been using American apples very well for um, a, a long time, mm -hmm. such as Finn river um, and river cidery in Washington's, um, you know, they're, they're very talented what they do with American apples. Others that are orchard based and they're making cider like wine. Mm -hmm. So the apple variety is front and center, just like a grape variety would be front and center in a single varietal wine. Um, they're starting to experiment a lot with crab apples, which is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. They're high acid and um, Americans seem to like higher acid ciders. That seems to be a thing. Um, whereas, you know, in the UK, it may be more about tannins. Um, and so crab apples are pretty exciting. Red fleshed apples are really exciting. Um, these are apples that when you cut in them, instead of being white on the inside, they're pink on the inside and the same molecules that make strawberries and plums pink also make those apples pink. So those flavors notes get carried, carried in the first time I had a red fleshed cider it was actually at an orchard in washington was, and i argued with the maker that there were strawberries in the cider he said no <laughs> there's no strawberries in the cider i said yes there has to be this has to have strawberries in it um oh. and and then there's some other like historical varieties like newtown pippin and gravenstein and some other like dual purpose american apples that um, can make a really amazing cider, but also make a really amazing pie. You don't want to make 
a pie out of some of these English cider varieties. They would, it would be terrible. Right. So um, <laughs> the dual purpose apples really like seem to hit a sweet spot with um, a lot of people's palates, but also give the gr- apple grower some flexibility. All right. I'm going to, I, 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 I got to ask you that first time you tried the red flesh apple, it was in Washington, which, which place, where was it? Who did you, who'd you try? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was Snowdrift cider. Okay. Um, and I don't think they're around anymore. No, but, no Snowdrift's yeah. around. He's just, around. he's just up the road yeah. from me. Tim? No, um, Peter. Uh, but Snowdrift. Oh, Peter, e- Peter, yeah. yeah. Okay. I was with Tim that day. But oh yeah. yeah. But, but Peter, yeah, he's, yeah. he's over. I'm in Wenatchee. They're over in East Wenatchee. He's maybe as the crow flies seven miles from me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, no. I must have, I, I think um, Tim may not be making cider anymore but that's great that peter's still growing and, apples because yeah. the apples that i had that day were very special yes snowdrift makes um now we're not talking apples their peri is their peri is phenomenal oh yeah their, their peri is phenomenal yeah. it was one of the first peris actually i think it was the first peri that i ever had yeah. um it was it's very good yeah, yeah I, I, i'm a huge fan i interviewed peter and a uh, great guy and he's played oh, he, he's played a role in a lot of <clears throat> other uh, cider, uh, Washington state cideries, uh, yeah. giving them some training, you know, they've worked, people come in and work for yeah. them for a while and then they go off and launch their right. own thing. He's kind of like the, the granddaddy of it, of it here in, 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 in Washington. Um, he's, yeah. he's pretty highly, um, he's very highly regarded. That's interesting because my first red fleshed apple cider was at there too. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, my they reaction was, my, yeah. my reaction was there's, this is, this is really cool. I like this. This is, but I yeah. did think that there was strawberry in it as well. So I'm, I, yeah. I gotta go with you. I would, I didn't argue, but I would have. I had you and I been there together. Had you and I been there together, I'd been sitting right next to you saying, "No, there's gotta be because it's just it's got a different, just a really subtle different, yeah, little something." Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your um, let's talk yeah. about your day to day for a little bit. So what sure. what do you do on the on, on the day to day? What what does a day look like for you? Well, um, I am looking over data as you, as you've figured out, I like my numbers, but the reason I like my numbers is because I'm advocating for the cider industry with the media and with beverage industry, um, and with Congress and TTB, the federal agency that regulates, um, alcohol. So I'm doing a lot of advocacy and I, I need to understand the trends and the numbers to um, be able to, to make my cases. Um, so why Congress? What, what that's, you know, that's, hmm. what, yeah. what, what do you, how do you interface with Congress? Well, I'm usually advocating for something specific. So right now we're leading up to advocating for, um, co-fermented ciders and wines and meads and not just co-fermented but also infused um, to be able to add the same level of carbonation as 100 percent apple ciders or 100 percent peri pears or 100 percent grape wines or 100 percent honey wines they have the ability to carbonate at a higher level as soon as you co-ferment even with each other, like a grape apple hybrid, mm-hmm. you can't carbonate as much without paying really high, um, sort of oppressive <laughs> bubble taxes that stem back to the U.S. wanting to get even with France and saying, "Well, <laughs> let's stick it to them with champagne." Okay. Um, but it had some unintended consequences that are now impacting a lot of wineries and cideries that like to blend the two right. um, occasionally. So that's an example. We call it the bubble bill. It hasn't been dropped yet, but we're working on it. So um, so let me let me make sure I understand this because I've had some other cider makers kind of say things in passing in conversations and all of that. Yeah. So beyond a certain level of carbonation, it triggers another tax level that, yeah. that yeah. then takes a, and I'm making up completely making up numbers here. If a, if a, uh, a bottle would retail or wholesale for like seven dollars. If the carbonation level is above the threshold, it might have to to wholesale for eleven dollars, making it less attractive to the consumer because it's ex- more far more expensive. Is that? Y- yeah, that's okay. a good, that's a 
very good summary of it. Okay. Um, consumers like bubbles and right. they complain often that the fruited ciders are flat because they don't have enough carbonation in them for their liking. So, um, hmm. yeah, so, so that's, and, and I mean, with, with wildfires too, we've definitely seen an increase in the number of apple wine apple grape hybrids mm -hmm. um as a as a mid you know disaster mitigation really like you got smoke paint well let's do what we can with the apples this year so, that's an interesting um, I mean, yeah now that you say that it seems very obvious i hadn't put those connections together but all right yeah okay so that's an example so you're you're you're, you're part of the voice lobbying congress to make some mod modernization of the rules yeah to uh yeah. to impact your your constituents if you will yeah. So what else? I mean, dealing with Congress should only take you five or ten minutes a day. It should be easy, <laughs> simple, straightforward. What, but what else? What else does your your day to day kind of look like? Yeah, I mean, a, a big part of my job and the association's role is to coordinate CiderCon, our annual conference. Okay. It is a it's a very big event. It's very complex. It's very special, um, and it does take up a large portion um, of my job. So. That conference um, roams around the country, and this year it's going to be in Portland, Oregon. We tried to have it in Seattle, but couldn't make it work. So we're doing tours to the Washington area to make up for it because we don't want to hurt the feelings of our very sensitive we're, friends. We're very Seattle. sensitive up here. <laughs> yep. So it's going to be in Portland this year. When, uh, well, the next is actually in 2024. So when I is, know, yeah. So when is CiderCon when is going to be held? January 16th through 19th. And if somebody were to go to that for the first time, what would they experience? They would experience a cider specific trade show that is more than a trade show because of the atmosphere. And by that, I mean cider and ping pong and pinball and other games um, and a tattoo bus. So it's the best trade show you've ever been to. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Stop, stop. I, you can't, I, I've got to bring you back in here. So ping pong, pinball, and tattoo bus. Yes. In fact, <laughs> I have heard that you're going to get some Apple Flash tattooed at CiderCon. Is that true? Uh, no, that is not true. Uh, you're so nasty. Uh, you no, got you to uh, rep your area. I do. Ne needles and I do not. We do not exist in the same room at any time. Um, well, maybe we'll get enough cider in you to change your mind. Nah, but, um, it, that's been tried and it's never worked. <laughs> but the, the, the trade show is very specific to the cider industry, which makes it unique. So there, you know, there's like cider pressing equipment and then, you know, cider and wine have some similar equipment that they share as do cider and beer, but that's, that's one of the things that makes the trade show um, really special. The other thing is that we have two full days of educational workshops. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really sets CiderCon apart from other beverage conferences is that it's not all just business. That's a big part of it, but the sensory part of it, getting to taste cider and talk about cider making and cider selling in the context of drinking cider mm -hmm. um, is is something that we put a lot of effort into. So so that's that. Um, and, and then Cider Share is our welcome reception where we have um, you know, 60 to 70 different cideries from around the world sampling out their cider for our opening night. And this year, our good friends at the Northwest Cider Association are um, hosting a special activation to highlight Northwest cideries. There will be a fair number of Washington cideries in that activation. So that's Cider Share. That's really special. Um, and then the other thing that's unique is every year we feature um, international cider makers to learn from them. Um, and this year, there is a very strong Nordic contingent coming to CiderCon. We've got several cider makers from Norway and Sweden joining us. So it's, it's a lot. It's very complex and very exciting. Um, and I, I, the other thing about CiderCon, that just every time somebody from the beer industry or the wine industry or the spirits industry comes to CiderCon, they comment on 
the inclusivity, the vibe, the welcomeness, the community. Um, you know, we're very, we're a very welcoming, open arms group. Okay. Um, so, about how many? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm having one of those moments. Uh, <laughs> It's my fault for making us meet so late in the day. No, I know. it's okay. It's no. <laughs> no, yeah. So, no, but about how many um, participants are there? And then also about how many attendees on a, on a average year, if you will? Um, well, I don't know if I have those things parsed out. So I would say, uh, you know, we typically have about a thousand people participate oh. in CiderCon every year. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and we're, we think it's going to be bigger this year because people are excited, believe it or not, to go to Portland. Um, so <laughs> we, we think it'll be a little bit bigger this year. Um, yeah. So, that you know, we're, we're, we're thrilled. Touche. I deserve that. Um, <laughs> I deserve that. Well, and I'm actually looking forward to going because it's it seems to me it seems very the one thing I enjoy about the cider industry and, and the reason that I um, started consuming ciders was uh, first off, no disrespect to the wine industry, but I, I have a feeling that if you were to put a flight of wines in front of me and say, Hey, which one do you like the best? I'd be that person that would pick the Franzia. That, that <laughs> That's my fear. My palate for wine is not it's just, I don't, I don't, pick up on the differences of it yeah and then beer doesn't play well anymore i can have a beer and wake up the next day feeling like i had a lot of them and it's just not pleasant so i tried i kind of stumbled into cider and found it to be um, an enjoyable beverage um, without the pretentiousness that can come with wine i mean not all wine i'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be well I'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you the uh the, the litmus test for if a winemaker is cool okay if they also make cider <laughs> so <laughs> well there's a lot of them do well yeah there's one i can think of one here in uh in in, in one actually that they they do um i don't i'm just kidding I no 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 that. i know but they do they make um <laughs> yeah. they make uh they do both um and there's well, it's a small project of a very large fruit grower. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you were asking me earlier about the day to day and like kind of what the ACA does and, and, you know, part of a big part of it is also cider sensory education. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the wine industry, they have sommeliers. Correct. In the beer industry, they have Cicerones. Okay. In the cider industry, we have certified pommeliers. Um, it's a play on word that, you know, uses the word palm for apples um, mm -hmm. and, and merges it with, with sommeliers. But this program is really designed to help educate the drinks industry about cider because mm -hmm. it's one of the things holding the industry back is that that broad brush just mm -hmm. keeps getting used to paint a picture of cider instead of understanding like the real depth and nuance and range. And we're really trying to do that education in a non-pretentious way because we don't, we don't want to have, you know, I went to the beer, a beer award show last year that had almost 200 categories of styles. Oof, and oof. it was just like, wow. Yeah. Um, and, and so we're trying to be um, approachable and engaging and, and keep it fun. That's, mm -hmm. that's really like, if I could think about one word to describe cider, it would be fun. Like okay. that, that is like what makes it unique. So the reason I bring this up is because we're really lucky to have our partnership with the Northwest Cider Association providing us with an opportunity to take our cider education on the road throughout the state of Washington next year. We're doing what we call a cider education road show, and we're going to hit up several cities throughout Washington. And so if there's anybody listening that is a bartender or a restaurant server or a chef or um, a retail worker or somehow caterer, somehow engaged in the drinks industry or in the food industry, or maybe they're a journalist or, or you know, 
has some reason to want to learn more about cider, uh, they should keep an eye on our website because we're going to be doing a lot of fun cider tasting, cider education classes throughout the state. And people will have the opportunity to take the level one certified cider professional exam, which is, um, you know, a great way to sort of show that, hey, I'm on board for the second wave of the American cider revolution. What season will you be doing this in? Is this going to be spring and summer? Is this going to be summer? Summer. Yeah. Okay. Well, that'd Which be is really a great cool. time to drink cider too. Well, no, absolutely. But you know, just, yeah. you know, so that's going to be very cool. So you're going to, you're going to do the road show. You're going to various, various cities in Washington state. Um, I would, I'm speculating that Seattle and Spokane would be two of them. Um, yeah. just, just from the population base. Um, okay. That's, that's very cool. And, and that's on your website or is that on your website now? It's or not yet. No, okay. we're still in the planning phase. It will be after CiderCon right now. A lot okay. of our bandwidth is, is going to all, all hands on deck for CiderCon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to pose this question. This is a negative question. Okay. But I'm going to pose it. In your opinion, what what is the biggest challenge right now? And where is cider not performing like you want it to as an industry? I think one of the things that's held cider back since the beginning is the perception that all cider is quite sweet. Okay. And um, there is a lot of sweet cider out there, and I'll tell you why there's a lot of sweet cider out there, because that's what the consumers are drinking. That's what they want. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an increasing amount of dry cider, and it's not hard to find dry cider. It's actually quite easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's hard to find dry cider if you're not presented the option. So let's say you go to a restaurant and they've got 200 IPA handles. I kid, maybe not 200, but a lot of IPA. Let's say 20. Handles. Let's just say 20 yeah, IPA handles. 20. And then they have one cider handle and mm -hmm. let's say it's sweet cider. Mm -hmm. So if you're an IPA lover, you're excited because there's a lot of choices, but if you're a cider drinker, they've just got one. Yeah. Um, you know, in Portland and Seattle, it's increasingly common to see two or three handles dedicated to different sweetness levels of mm -hmm. cider, but you're not always going to see that in other places. So I still think we're overcoming that like cider is a beer style conversation as opposed to cider is a whole category. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a, a lot of retailers put cider on their beer list. Um, and I, you know, I would love to see cider called out and, and be separate and have, you know, cider lists, like cider lists are not that crazy in States like Washington, right? Like you open the page and it should be like rosés, reds, wines, bubbles, and apples, right? Like have an apple section on your wine list or mm -hmm. on your draft list, like have a couple choices. So I think that we, you know are still struggling um but it's it's changing i've seen i've i'm, I'm seeing the change real time mm -hmm. it's taking a while but it's it's happening um people are starting to welcome the the diversity do you, uh, do you think that part of the confusion on the public's part is that when you go into a grocery store cider is if it's in cans it's in the beer section and because it's in a can, I mean, yes, I know wine comes in a can. I understand that, but you know, someone, someone would then anybody that likes wine would say, but not good wine, but you know, wine, wine comes in bottles for the most part and beer comes in cans and, and, and cider's coming more. I see more, when I go to my local grocery store, I see more cider in cans than I do in bottles. And so it gets kind of, it's the, the little brother that gets tagged along in the, in the big brother's shelf, if you will. And do you think that that might be in some ways holding the public back from trying and because it's, they walk into, I'll just say Safeway or Fred Meyer. There's, there's one that's down at both, both, both of our markets. They walk into Fred Meyer. They walk down the, they're looking for cider. They walk down the beer aisle and they're bombarded with, with Budweiser and with Coors and in Miller and, and brands that are just so prevalent in our, our brains because of 
billions of dollars of advertising and they're looking for a cider and maybe they're fatigued and they just grab beer again and they don't, they don't, they don't go try something new. I personally wish I saw more cider in bottles. Personally, I like, I prefer, I like cider in bottles. I don't know why that is. I just think cider in bottles is, I like that experience. That's my personal experience. So I just wonder, do you, cans are certainly convenient. I mean, they really are. Yeah. You know, most cider makers would love to sell their cider in bottles, but the consumer is not buying it. And really? they, they, yeah, I mean, it, it actually, there are still some cider makers who have not canned. In fact, there are a couple pretty prevalent ones in, in Washington who just, they're not doing it. They're not canning. They're, they're bottled. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, my, my approach has always been like, put the high end cider in a can so that people are willing to experience because the can actually makes it, I think, more approachable to people. First of all, it's a volume that's maybe less committal. Um, something about a can makes it feel less pretentious. Um, so I've always been like, let's help consumers get access to the cider. If the retailers are refusing to take cider bottles, which a lot of them will refuse to take cider bottles for whatever reason. I mean, mm-hmm. my challenge to retailers would be, well, have you tried dedicating an entire area to cider and putting mm-hmm. all the bottles there and labeling it cider? But if you go into independent bottle shops, uh, I wish I could remember the name of this great grocery store that I went to in Tacoma. It was so amazing. Their cider selection was incredible. And they had a ton of bottles. Um, like, was it, like was it the Metropolitan Market? Yes. Yes, I had so much fun shopping for cider. They had um, Nashi Orchards from Bashan Island in the bottle, mm-hmm. um, but they they had a very good, very good selection and a mixture of bottles and cans, which I think, um, you know, that's not. <laughs> There's this weird thing in people's mind when they think about like what's holding cider back. They point out all these things that are actually common to the entire beverage industry. Okay. Bottles and cans is a great example. There is wine available in bottles and cans. There is beer available in bottles and cans. Like it's it's but but I do think that cider has a little bit of a handicap in that it does not have an iconic packaging. And that I think, ha- you know, I spin it as like, oh, well, that's great because we can be nimble and go in whatever packaging the consumer wants. But if I could travel back in time and somehow foster the development of an iconic packaging for cider, I would because we call them beer cans, right? Like we call them beer cans and we call them wine bottles. And even when like hard seltzer first came out, it's like that category is not doing great right now, but it was, you know, really hot, like in 2019. Mm-hmm. And part of the way the category grew was in these slender cans. Right. And it became like the seltzer can. So mm-hmm. now there's a seltzer can, but there's no cider can. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the packaging that is iconic for cider are these flip top bottles. Mm-hmm. These um, like 500 mil, 750 mil bottles with um, the like flip top with a, a plastic um, insert and the uh, metal like mm-hmm. spray. Kind of like the old school uh, beer. Um, there, I remember when I was a kid, there was a, a jerk. Yeah. Of, um, that, that, yeah, it was like the old, I'll call it a very old school way of, of sealing a bottle to keep the carbonation. Yes. The, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like you could probably get a sarsaparilla in that at some point, but exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it does. It it's sort of to me, it's the closest thing we have today to iconic packaging, um, mm-hmm. and those are so expensive. Nobody's going to use them because the consumer's not going to pay for it typically, unless it's a really high high end um, cider. I mean, I say that, but I know cideries that that's all, that's all they use. Um, and it works for them, but they probably aren't on chain retail shelves would be my guess. They're probably more of a direct to consumer come to the cidery tasting room model. 
that. Right. Well, and another, maybe this is another challenge. I didn't want to, I'm not trying to be negative here, but one of the other challenges, just like in Wenatchee, I don't know in your, in your market, if you can do this or not, we don't have the ability to recycle glass here. Our glass oh. goes in the garbage can. Oh. I know. And that's the way it's been in a couple of, a uh, couple of places I've lived in Washington state. Yeah. We don't, you, if you're going to take and you want to recycle glass, you have to take it to a specific location, sort it out by, you know, clear, green, brown, and dump it in these bins. Loud, yeah. messy, yeah, inconvenient. Yeah. So most people then take the easy route and they just throw it in their trash can. Which is a shame because glass is so eminently recyclable. It should be, yeah. it should, in my opinion, it should be recycled everywhere. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's, I think that's a negative to glass for cider. I mean, in the fact, what do you do with the bottle when you're done? Yeah. I mean, what do you do with the bottle when you're done? And glass does have a heavy footprint because it is physically heavy. Right. So, um, you know, I'm excited. Like I care about sustainability and I care about cider being at the forefront of sustainability, particularly when it comes to beverages. Um, I think cider has a lot going for it uh, versus the other segments. And so I am hoping that the cider makers out there are paying close attention to some of the innovations and hopefully I can help highlight them for them mm -hmm. in, in sustainable packaging. Um, you know, I, I, this conversation is, is happening a lot in the wine industry right now. Um, innovative recycling programs where you return the bottle, for example, Mm -hmm. Um, and also paper bottles are like something that people, yeah. Paper wine bottles. Yeah. Well, I mean, I see, I see when I see box wine and I see some of them, I see that, that there, it is not just a, a bag inside a cardboard container. There's the, that heavy duty. I've seen water in cardboard. I've seen, mm -hmm. but how do you keep the carbonation in a cardboard? How do you seal? Is the technology there that you could seal a, a cardboard box and keep carbonation in it? I'm not sure about the carbonation. That's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. That would be. But I, and, and cider, like for all of you out there that like to kayak or hike or, you know, whatever your outdoor sport is, like there's nothing better than getting a cider bag in a box. Um, there are a few Washington cideries that are doing it, but they aren't carbonated, but still cider is, you know, it drinks like a wine. So mm -hmm. you could, you know, just like in wine, you can have bubbles or not. Um, so check out getting a bag in the box. I think Alpen Fire does a great bag in the box cider. Okay. Well, I have an idea. This just popped in my head. I, there used to be a British beer that was imported. It was pretty common. Bottinger's maybe it was a brown ale and it had a little capsule in the can. And when you pop, when you pop the top, it broke the, the carbonation capsule. Oh my. And, it, and it carbonated and it wasn't an expensive beer. It was, I mean, I could afford it back then. And so it certainly was, it, it had to be price competitive to, to everything I would consume. You know, it's not that I was a snob. <laughs> okay. I was thrifty and I just remember, so it was, it had a little, like a little carbonation capsule in it mm -hmm. that carbonated the beer. I wonder if that technology would work with cider in a can. Or in this case, a well, how are you gonna pop it in a box? Yeah, in a box, mind. yeah. yeah you, never mind. But but I'm like, there's probably some gizmo out there that you can buy on an in-flight magazine to like <laughs> carbonate your beverages as they're going into your pint glass. I don't know. Uh, you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. You're you're probably right. So, but one thing before we move really off of CiderCon all the way, you you had mentioned earlier there's gonna be some tours and yeah. you were going to um. Uh, so why don't we talk about those tours? Because the one I kind of heard in passing was going up to the Seattle area to Puget Sound. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about these tours. And the reason I'm excited to talk about them with your listeners is because even if people aren't attending CiderCon, they can recreate these itineraries on their own and have mm -hmm. a cider road trip. So um, just like you would go wine tasting, you go cider tasting. So mm -hmm. if you're in the Seattle area for the Seattle tour, uh, the cool thing about this tour is that it's visiting um, five different cideries that are all 
extremely different in their approaches. Okay. So there's this cidery called Greenwood Cider Company. The first time I met them, they were literally making all their cider and carboys in a storage unit. They were teeny tiny, teeny, teeny, <laughs> tiny. They're much bigger now. I mean, they're not giant. They're still very, they're nano cidery, but um, they make great ciders um, and they have beautiful branding and they're just fun to talk to. Um, and then there's Locust Cider. Locust Cider is doing really innovative stuff with flavor, um, you know, coffee cider. We're collaborating with local coffee roasters um, and Seattle Cider Company and Schilling Cider Company. They're two of the bigger cider companies, not only in the Northwest, but in the country. Um, and they have different styles of cider. So it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to like taste the differences there. Um, and then Yonder Cider, which is a new up and coming cidery that also uh, has a juice facility um, in your neck of the woods. She called does. Source. Yep. Um, so that's really exciting. And then one of the things that's really cool about this tour is that it has a cider themed focused restaurant as part of the tour, which, um, you know, there aren't many of them not only in the U S but in the world and Seattle has one of the best. So that's going to be a really fun tour, uh, particularly for just exploring, you know, from teeny tiny to one of the biggest in the country. And, mm -hmm. uh, they're all right there in the Seattle area. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Locust cider. Okay. I love, I love coffee. Yeah. Like coffee, coffee is my thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Coffee cider, I'll try it, but I'm really skeptical. Um, I was skeptical too, but I tried coffee cider. I don't think I've had locust, but I've had coffee cider, and it, it was actually really good. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, uh, no offense to anybody there, locust. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm skeptical on that one, but I will try it, and I will admit if I am wrong. Have you tried Yonder's? Is it the cashmere? Yes. The, where they yeah. partner with uh, Fast Penny Spirits. Yeah. They're um, it's almost like a Negroni. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, uh, th I like that a lot. That's, that is a, um, both, both Yonder, I've had Yonder on the show and I've had Fast Penny Spirits on the show. Oh, great. Both, both women owned businesses that are doing some yeah. amazing things. And to see that, that pairing, um, in fact, I was in Seattle a couple of weeks ago to uh, meet with some people for a recording session. And I was over by Fast Penny's um, storefront mm. and I got there too early. They weren't open yet. Otherwise mm. I would have probably snuck in and my wife really likes their, their, their product. Yeah. They make great stuff. They do. So that's the Seattle one. Where, do you have any other tours up here in Washington that you've laid, that you guys have laid out? Yeah, we have another one. Um, it's also an overnight tour and it's on the Olympic Peninsula. And this one is really highlighting like the what we call harvest driven cideries. Um, so you know they are focused um, on on the local apples, um, and they happen to have orchards nearby. So Eagle Mont, uh, Alpen Fire, and Finn River. And what's interesting, I think, is that these are all smaller Finn River is pretty big but still smaller um cideries but they're mm -hmm. all using sort of an orchard driven driven model mm -hmm. um and it's a really big part of their story so uh and then they're going to South Puget Sound Community College to check out their craft brewing and distilling center it's like an educational center for training people um in the beverage industry and then the very exciting thing about that tour is that they're spending the night at Fort Warden Historical State Park, um, spending the night in some of the historic officer homes. So that's going to be an adventure, and it's just a beautiful area to explore. Yeah, too. I know that that is that is a beautiful area of the state. I yeah. would one hundred percent agree with you on that. And Alpen Fire Cider uh, just won Best in Show at the Northwest Cider Cup for mm -hmm. one of their ciders. Um, Nancy and Bear and Philippe are, uh, you know, they're, they're I've, pretty. I've had, I've had Philippe on the show. He was oh, a lot great. of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had Finn River on the show. Um, I have not had Eagle Mont, uh, on that, which will, one of these days we'll remedy that. I mean, that's, yeah, a, they're you know. a small diversified farm, which is, um, 
and they they utilize that in their cider making. It's pretty they're they're pretty neat cider company. I like them a lot. We're gonna we're gonna circle back to something that kind of started you on your journey, but I'd like to ask you now some what do you like what do you personally like to pair cider with food wise? What's what are some what are some complimentary tastes that you like to see together? Well, just like wine and beer, you can kind of pair cider really well with anything if you know what you're doing. But the thing that I think is really unique about cider is that you don't have to try quite as hard to identify the pairing. (laughs) Cider pairs, and I'm not kidding, cider pairs better with food than wine, beer, or spirits. It is the most food-friendly beverage out there, period. Um, my favorite thing to, to pair it with are, are oysters, but it might just be because I love oysters, but, um, and cheese, obviously cheese goes very, very well with cider. Um, you know, but it, it goes well with desserts. It goes well with, I really like it with Indian food and Thai food and sushi, um, those like Asian cuisines go exceptionally well with cider. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's just sort of like the richness of the broths or the flavors and the mm-hmm. spice. It's just cut really well by the acidity of the cider. And that's, that's what makes cider so food friendly is that it's not super high ABV. It's not mm-hmm. going to be super hoppy and heavy. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be sort of bright and crisp and lifting and, yeah. You know, our our pairing recommendations um, go from everything from grilled vegetables to kind of the classic is is pork chops. Um, so if you're if you're a pork fan, cider should be your best friend because there's there's no better pairing than than pork and cider. But I do like pork and I do love pairing pork and cider. Um, BLT and cider is like one of my favorite things. But I will never forget having my mind blown by pairing a method champenoise cider from Alpenfire with a homemade chocolate chip cookie. And it just went so well together. So I, I really encourage people to experiment pairing cider with any food. I mean, it, it is really versatile. Hmm. I was going to ask you to name something that, you know, name a food pairing that's a little like you think would co- catch me by surprise. The cookie did it. So I won't <laughs> ask the question. You, you got me with the cookie. Like, really? I mean, yeah. I see it now. I mean, but yeah. I would, my, and it was also, as you saw me kind of turn my head when you said <laughs> Indian Thai and sushi. And then yeah. as I think about it, it does make sense. Yeah. I, I just hadn't, I haven't, I haven't made, I haven't taken that extra step. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, when you look at wine pairings for those cuisines, often they'll suggest like Rieslings, mm-hmm. um, and and so you can kind of extrapolate from there because Riesling and cider do have some things in common. Right. There's yeah. There's some. To me, yeah. that's a, a a reasonable. Uh, yeah, there's a reasonable connection to those two. Yeah. Those two. All right. Yeah. So I'm gonna. I am going to put you on the spot. What sh- no, I'm not asking your favorite brand. That would be impossible. But what is your favorite style of cider? What do you, what do you really like? Depends on the day. Okay. Um, I really do like blends. Okay. Um, but I like blends of a couple apples rather than, I mean, I, I enjoy the field blends where it's like, yeah, there's, 50 apples in this bottle which (laughs) happens a lot and it's really exciting when they list them all in the variety i'm like this is reads like an edward abbey novel i'm just gonna read all the apples (laughs) um but i like to kind of geek out on okay well this apple is bringing tannins and this apple is bringing fruit esters and this apple is bringing acid and like that's you know i'm bringing an apple nerd perspective to to my cider drinking um, so either single varietals or a couple of varietals where I get to explore those, those apples. Um, I don't care if it's in a bottle or a can, but I do, I think, you know, a can doesn't have enough cider in it for me. So I tend to drink bottles. Um, but there's something that we haven't talked about at all that I am really keen on. And that is quince cider. 
So Quince is sort of uh, developing an underground following in the Apple-driven kind of nerdy cider community. Um, and it adds beautiful floral notes and melon notes and tropical notes. And it, you know, my favorite ciders, I think, are ones that have a really bright um, aroma to them or like a really complex aroma to them. Um, I just enjoy smelling the cider. Uh, that could be dating back to when I first took this job. I was actually pregnant and had to go to a lot of cider events where all I could do was smell. So that was sort of my introduction to the cider community was just smelling a lot of cider. And so I kind of developed an affinity for the ones that have really big aromas and um, not all apple varieties do. So right. does your, does, does your, your spouse share the enthusiasm <laughs> or is it like, are we talking work again? I mean, you bring this home all the time. Can't we just go out? You know, I mean, how's, how, how does that work? Yeah. Um, it, you know, he loves craft beer um, and he also loves cider and he, you know, the other day I said, uh, he's like, you got a box of cider in the mail. I'm like, okay, thanks. Um, he's like, there's a, a, I think it was a Harrison. There's a Harrison in there, or I don't remember the apple variety, but there was an apple variety that he like recognized and got excited about. So he's definitely a beer first, but I think cider is probably a close second for him which um, I, I will take. Like people, all, you know, sometimes people will be like, is cider really your favorite beverage? And I'm like, yeah, it is. Do you think I would have taken this job if it wasn't my favorite beverage? Like I always choose cider. I went to see a movie last night at the Hollywood Theater. They had Double Mountain Dry Cider on tap. Um, and that's absolutely what I drank with my popcorn, given the choice. So Okay. So what about your husband? What is he like beer-wise? Beer what is he, what's... What's he gravitate towards? Oh gosh, I'm gonna get get it. He likes hazy IPAs. You're gonna get hate mail, um, but okay. he he likes hazy IPAs. Um, and there's a few Oregon breweries that he's really really loyal to. So that's okay. Yeah. So. yeah. Say you you know takes all types. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 no seriously. So uh, I will say this: I have tried some ciders that have paired you know jalapeno with cider or pineapple with cider sure i haven't there's been some some things like i like i'm really skeptical about the coffee cider thing. okay but it, so has there been any any pairings that for you just didn't like you're like yeah this doesn't work for me um there was i i guess it's traditional um and i haven't had it in a traditional context, but someone was trying to replicate a cider that was fermented on hay. And I'm okay with barnyard notes, but that one was a little, I, I think I was maybe just taken off guard. Um, I've also had cider co-fermented with mushrooms that I wasn't my favorite. Yeah, uh, see, that doesn't, that doesn't, I mean, I, I love the idea that people are trying and they're experimenting. I love yeah. this. Yeah. And not everything is for everyone. Yeah. And so, like, I I think I've had one with habanero, and it just it just, it just doesn't, that's just not for me. That's all. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the effort and the, and the, 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 the blend and the trying and the skill. Just not, not my thing. Okay. Yeah. I, I love spicy ciders. I love, um, you know, fruited ciders, particularly when they're co-fermented. There's like a subtleness mm -hmm. that I appreciate of the co-fermentation versus the, um, the infusion. Both, both are great, but, um, uh, yeah, like plum cider is really good. Berry ciders are really good. Uh, mm -hmm. stone fruit ciders are excellent in general, yeah. just like cherry, peach, plum. They're all great <laughs> in, in co-fermates. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I Cher cherries, cherries. I, yeah. Yeah. I tend to like the cherry stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but I also really like rhubarb cider. I think Eagle Bout, at least in the past, makes a great rhubarb. I cider. have not tried. Now see, I think I would like that. Yeah. I think that would be a, 
uh, a pairing that I would I would like. Well, that's, that's interesting. my Easter tradition. So you should try it on Easter. You got to find yourself some Washington made rhubarb cider and have it as part of your Easter if you celebrate Easter. But it could be that's your, okay. Your spring uh, 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 as well. All right, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So as we as we wrap this up, I got I've got a handful of questions to throw at you. Okay. Um, now, as I said earlier, I'm a coffee fan, so we're going to switch gears. I'm going to throw you off with cider. Okay. I'm going to come down to Portland, and if they let me across the border, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> Your picture's on the bridge. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, I'm looking for a great cup of coffee in Portland. Yeah. I know there's. I know I have choices, <laughs> but I want to try something that is more. Uh, for example, everybody knows Starbucks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you're a coffee drinker in the Northwest, you know Stumptown. Yeah. So if we exclude those two, just because I've already had them. Yeah. Where's a great coffee? A place, where's a great place for me to get a cup of coffee in the Portland area? Well. I was tempted to give you something near CiderCon, but there's just a coffee shop that's too near and dear to my heart, and I just have to recommend them. Everybody who's going to Portland has to go to Fresen Bakery, F-R-E-S-S-E-N. It's a bakery and coffee shop. They have great cappuccinos and lattes, um, but what they really are known for are, are their German pastries, and they are just, holy moly, are they good. Um, so I really, I really like Fresen Bakery. Um, and I also really like this, uh, coffee shop that's, um, in a different part of town called Either Or. That's, um, homage to the Elliot, Elliot Smith album, e Either Or. And they do really unique stuff, um, as well. So those, those would be my two recommendations are Either Or and Fresen. They're both, both very unique, um, very Portland. And if we were going to go there together, what would... What coffee beverage would you be ordering? I, I am a cappuccino <coughs> person. When You're a cappuccino I'm at a person. coffee shop. If I'm on the go, I get a latte. But if I'm at a coffee shop, I get a cappuccino. Okay. Yeah. Solid, solid, solid. Yeah. All right. Second part of this question is I'm always getting into town around lunchtime. Yes. Where's a great place to grab lunch in, in Portland? Yeah. So Portland, I think probably much like Seattle, is known for its food carts. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the food carts that I really love is actually part of a brewery called Berlick Brewing. Okay. And Berlick Brewing has a couple different locations in Portland. So you have to do your homework, but one of them is called Barley Pod and the Barley Pod has a great, um, curation of food carts. Um, and the other thing that they have is they usually have three to four different ciders available. Um, and they've got indoor and outdoor seating and the outdoor seating is heated with cover. Um, and it's just kind of a beautiful location tucked away in a really like, neighborhood part of mm -hmm. Northeast Portland in, in kind of near the Hollywood district. It's really, I really love um, having lunch at, at the barley pod. So that's, okay. that's a great name. Yeah. That's very cool. Name. Yeah. All right. Before I ask you the last question, <laughs> okay. what should we have talked about that we didn't bring up today? Oh gosh. Um, I think we covered a lot of it. I mean, I think one thing I just want to mention to folks is that if they're looking for ways to explore cider, check out cider festivals. Washington has a, a lot of them all summer long. So if you're doing your summer planning, make sure you're looking for cider festivals. There's some great ones um, on, on the various islands, um, some great ones in Eastern Washington and Seattle area. Cider Summit is sort of an iconic cider festival in, mm -hmm. in Seattle. So check those out. Do you, down in, in Oregon, uh, up here, a lot of our farmer's markets, cider, cideries, cider makers show up at the farmer's markets a yeah. lot of times. So, yeah. And you can try, you know, literally from the back of their car type yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. really, you know. Uh, do, do you have that same sort of experience down in, in Oregon as yeah. well? As, are the farmer's markets good? another good place to go? Yeah. There are okay. a lot of farmer's markets in, in Portland, and a lot of them are year-round. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is the most important question I'm going to ask you all day. You ready? I'm ready. Cake or pie <laughs> and why? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say 
say cake just because I'm not a good baker and it's one I can make myself and I really do love cooking and I really like my own cooking. <laughs> okay. Not that I don't like other people's cooking. There's just something very somatic for me about cooking a meal and sharing it with people. And so okay. cake is much easier to make than pie. I've never I've never successfully made a pie. Um and I also really like pairing apple cake with cider, like a French Normandy style apple cake paired with cider or pomo. We didn't even talk about pomo. Have you had pomo, Scott? Yes, I have. Oh man, that's good stuff. Yes, it is. Very good stuff. <laughs> it goes very well with cake. <laughs> yes, 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 it would. Actually, that's a really interesting pairing. Okay. Yes. Uh, hmm. Note to self. For okay. the listeners, Pomo is apple brandy back sweetened with apple juice, and it is yeah. extremely drinkable. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, it's a dangerous liquid. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's dangerous. Yeah. No, I um. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna break all my rules. I have already. We talked <laughs> Oregon a lot in this episode. Did I ever tell you the reason why I pick on Oregon? Did I Did I tell you the backstory here? Uh, I don't know. You told me a couple stories. I'm not so, sure. So the backstory is when I first started this podcast, I made a comment about how I didn't like Spokane as a kid. Well, look at me. I'm an old man. <laughs> Spokane has changed a lot since I was a teenager, or preteen, like 10 to 13 age. And I made a comment about, and I grew up in Tacoma, which isn't exactly the Mecca of, you know, thumbs up either. And somebody started giving me grief about how dare you talk about Spokane. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not. So it's like, well, this is a Washington show. We'll just pick on Portland. I mean, it's just, we can just pick on Portland because it's across the river and we'll just pick on Portland. That's kind of how this came about. I really, truly do enjoy Oregon a lot. I think Portland's got a lot going for it. Like, like lots of major cities it has its challenges. Bend is a beautiful place. I like Eugene a lot. Yeah. Uh, Medford and, and down there. I mean, you, 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 it's a, the two, the two areas, Washington, Oregon, we are so lucky to live in these regions with just amazing things to do. There is year, nowhere year more round. beautiful in the world. I am convinced. I, I yeah. go backpacking um, on the Olympic Peninsula every summer, and I am just walking around with my jaw dropped the whole time because right. it's so beautiful. Well, in the in the Columbia River Gorge is oh, is it, you know, magical. Um, you know, and so I, it, this is really good natured ribbing, but okay. So I have talked to a lot of Washington state cider professionals. Give me a shout out to a couple of Oregon ones that are doing, cause I'm just not aware of them. I just don't, I don't pay any attention to them because I pay attention to the Washington stuff. So who's doing some cool stuff in Oregon in your back, in your backyard, who's doing cool stuff? <laughs> um, all right, man. Well, there's a newer cidery called Raw Cider that is making um, French style ciders with fruit that's actually, he's got a pear orchard across the river in, in Washington. So there's like an interesting thing going on there. His ciders are very traditional style, but they're super well balanced and like really great with, with any sort of um, elevated meal. Um, there's another cidery called Art and Science that does all kinds of fun co-ferments, including my favorite, Quince. They're out in wine country. Um, actually, a lot of these are out in wine country. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times journalist Nicholas Kristoff has an award-winning cider that he's making in Oregon. Um, him and his family uh, are, are, okay. are making some pretty awesome ciders. They, they just released a cider wine hybrid. Um, Bauman cider is one of the larger sort of orchard based ciders. Um, mm -hmm. they make everything from pet nat Kingston black single varietal ciders to, uh, Marionberry ciders, you know, they do, they're doing the whole range and it's all, all done really well. Mm -hmm. Um, those are all sort of, that's like one pocket. I mean, if we go like to the South, there's some great folks um, in Southern Oregon, Apple Outlaw and Blossom Barn. Blossom Barn is doing 100% Perry ciders, which is really a, a different um, approach and they're doing it doing it really well. Um, um, man, I like wanna name them all now. Oh, Wildcraft in Eugene, you were talking about Eugene. 
Wildcraft and Eugene. I went in there and they had all these barrels bubbling away. And I learned about like 10 fruits I'd never heard of before. Um, they do all foraging models. So if oh. they happen to forage a bunch of Chester berries, which is one of the ones I didn't really know about. What's uh, a Chester berry? Yeah, it's, it's in the cane berry family. Um, they, yeah, so they are doing really unique co-ferments. Um, I'm looking at my <laughs> wall of cans. I have a wall of cans here. You have a wall of cans. I have a wall okay. of cans. That's that's a few. That's a few of them. So I, those, yeah. that's that, those. I see. I I'm impressed with a, a couple of the names are really intriguing to me. Yeah. And B, if we're foraging, that's a cool. That's a. It's hard to sustain that because you know what you forage today, you might not be able to forage tomorrow. Yeah. But yeah. it does make for a nice, interesting limited run, um, and sometimes I think maybe an overly homogenized product that's the yeah. same all the time gets a little dull. So maybe, maybe we, maybe we should be looking at smaller batches of, of more. Um, well, one of the things that's unique about apples is that a lot of them are biennial, meaning like they don't grow every year. They grow every right. other year. And so one of the things that's holding cider back is that cider over 7% ABV, it's illegal for them to list the harvest year on their label because that is only permitted for 100% grape wines that qualify for an appellation. Um, so they can't talk about when, you know, they can't make their product appear unique in its marketing through talking oh. about harvesting. So that's one of the things that I'm oh. trying to advocate to change. That's an example of some of the work that I'm doing for change. I've been working yeah. on that issue for a long time. It's very complicated and it's taking way longer than I would like. Um, and, you know, just the fact that there are no AVAs for cider and you're not allowed most of the time, like a lot of times their labels will get rejected because it's too close to a wine appellation. Um, I know people who have gotten their labels rejected because they called them Northwest apples and Northwest felt like a wine appellation to the TTV. So um, we... If you really oh. got into the wonkiness of it, cider has so many barriers. It's amazing that we thrive the way that we do in spite of it all. Like between the taxes and the regulations, it's pretty challenging. Um, so, yeah. That's, we could have gone down that I rabbit know. hole I'm the whole we episode. Did it. I'm glad we did I mean, it. We could have gone down. No, that would have been kind of a, a fascinating, for at least for me, it'd be a fascinating yeah. conversation. So, Michelle. Where can people find out more about you, Cider Association, Cider Con, anything else that you want to leave the audience with? Where's a good place to find that information? Yeah, so uh, you can learn about the association and Cider Con on our website at ciderassociation.org. If people are looking for information on how to pair ciders or cook with ciders or just learn more about ciders from a consumer lens, they should check out ciderculture.com um that is uh or, or cider craft magazine as well there there are mm -hmm. and that one's washington based um yep. but uh, we have a partnership with cider culture um and we try to promote uh, a lot of cideries in there including washington cideries but there's a lot of great recipes um and, uh, cocktail recipes uh, that's my homework for everybody is to make a holiday cider cocktail to share with your family that's my homework okay i yeah. that is not something that i have tried a lot of is cider cocktails um and that's an interesting we could have we could take another hour <laughs> to discuss that but yeah. we will we'll table that for today but thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today and and tell us all about you know oregon ciders but not just that but about cider in general because it is so relevant to Washington in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, Oregon. It, yeah, it really is relevant. It's a really important and like delicious part of what it means to be a Washingtonian. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Appreciate it. Yeah, this was really fun. Thanks for geeking out on cider with me. Hope you enjoyed the show. You can reach me on Twitter at Explore La State. I'd love to hear your comments. You can also visit our website at explorewashingtonstate.com. If you know anyone who would like the show, 
It'd be amazing if you'd share the show with them. This is the biggest way that we grow this show. Good old word of mouth. Glad you were here with me today, and I hope to have you listening to the next episode. See you then.